Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> so today we'll be continuing our sermon in the book of Galatians. So a couple of weeks ago, when I stood up here, I started by giving you or teaching through the first nine verses. Today, we'll continue on the first chapter of the book of Galatians, and we will actually complete the first chapter today. So by way of review, Paul was the, was the person who went into the city of Galatia, the town of Galatia, to teach the people there, the Christians there. After he left, you had people known as Judaizers who crept into the church to now teach a gospel that was polluted, a gospel that added something that um, that was completely contrary to the actual gospel message itself. And what it was that the Judaizers crept into the church to teach was doctrine of circumcision. And not just that, but the whole ceremonial law itself, along with the message of Jesus Christ. And the Judaizers were gaining influence in the churches there. And as a result, Paul felt it necessary to write this letter to the churches in Galatia to correct them from this false and erroneous teaching. So the overarching message in this book is that our salvation and with that all the accompanying benefits comes not from works of the law, but faith in Jesus Christ alone. We'll notice in the first two chapters of this book, Paul establishing his credentials and defending his ministry. Then we'll start to see at the end of the chapter, chapter two, throughout chapter four, Paul laying out the overall thesis of his message. And then in chapters five and six, we'll notice that Paul will start to give some practical applications in light of what he taught in chapters three through four. So by way of review, when I spoke last time, there were a couple points that I, that I made in regards to the first nine verses. And I'd like to go over that before we dive into the next section here. The first point that I, the first thing that I would like to point out to you, if you recall, was in the first few verses, chapter, verses one and two, where Paul mentioned that he was an apostle not sent from man, nor through the agency of man. If you remember, I had mentioned how throughout Paul's letters, he does usually reference himself. He does usually, when he introduces himself, will either call himself an apostle or a bondservant or a slave. However, here, he not only identified himself as an apostle, but he also made this qualifier where he said, not sent from man, nor through the agency of man. And if you recall, the reason he did that was because of the fact that the Judaizers were challenging his authority, were challenging the fact of whether or not he was actually called by God. So Paul, at the very onset, had to let it be known that he was indeed sent by God. Then we notice in this in the uh, second verse how Paul still referred to these churches in Galatia as churches. And how that ought to be a reminder to us that even though we will come across churches in which doctrine might be off, we should be slow in dismissing them as churches. Then we also notice in verse 6 how quickly these Galatian Christians strayed away from the gospel truth and how we ought to be careful to not do as much, to be diligent in the things that we are taught so that we don't stray away whenever false teaching comes about. And then we see Paul in verses 7 through 9 remind us how there is only one true gospel message. And anyone who preaches any other message is not preaching the gospel message, but a false gospel. And then we see also in this passage how God deals, or how Paul deals with the flock versus how he deals with the wolves. How gentle he was in his speech to the sheep, but how vicious he was in, his, in the words that he uses for the wolves, the people that came into the church to teach these false doctrines. So, Paul spends the rest of this chapter defending 
his ministry. Why is that? Why did Paul find it necessary for him to do this very thing? Because he realized that his work with the Galatians, in particular, his influence depended on his credibility. Douglas Moo tells us this. The truth of the gospel is Paul's focus in this section. But the Galatians received the gospel from Paul. And so, to have confidence in the gospel, they must also have confidence in the messenger who proclaimed that gospel to them. The truth of the gospel and Paul's credentials as an authoritative messenger of that gospel are therefore woven together in this part of the letter. I am sure Paul more than likely would have loved to have dived right in to the thesis of his letter. But the reality is that if the Galatians saw him as an imposter or as someone who was taught all he knew by the apostles, like the Judaizers claim, and was now running counter to them, then this letter would have been ignored. We would like for any ideological fight, especially us in the conservative camp, to be merely a battle of ideas. However, much of the time, if a person can be discredited, the idea is never dealt with. So while it is best to argue ideas, oftentimes a person has to first defend themselves in order to properly deal and argue for ideas. I remember earlier this morning, I was watching a docu-series about the 90s, and in one of the episodes, it chronicled the O.J. Simpson trial which was a trial that took place when I was pretty, pretty young. I mean, quite frankly, the only thing I really remember, honestly, was being mad that they, that they cut to the famous Bronco scene as I was watching Family Matters. But the reason I bring this up was, as I was watching this docuseries, and they were chronicling the O.J. Simpson trial, what was interesting was that the attorneys had evidences stacked against O.J. Simpson. But the defense attorneys, Johnny Cochran and, and the crew, what they did was they sought to discredit one of the police officers who, um, who arrested O.J. Simpson by, making, by painting him as a racist itself. And it worked. O.J. Simpson was acquitted, not because of the facts of the case, but because they were able to discredit one of the police officers that arrested O.J. Simpson. So. In the same way, oftentimes, as I mentioned, we would love just to be able to argue for our ideas, but oftentimes we first have to defend ourselves, and this is what Paul is doing here. He's laying out the defense for himself because if he doesn't do that, then everything that he'll say will now fall on deaf ears. So, with that said, let's read Galatians chapter 1. We'll start on verse 10, and we'll go through the end of the chapter. Uh, 24. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God, or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to be acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still un unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing. He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God 
because of me. So, right off the gate, Paul asked this question. Am I seeking the favor of men or of God? Am I seeking to please man or am I seeking to please God? Paul, in his call to the ministry and teaching of a doctrine that humbled men and glorified God, he wasn't the one that was seeking to curry favor with men. Paul says as such in Galatians chapter 5, verse 11, when he says, But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. See, though the Judaizers were seeking to slander Paul, making it seem as though Paul was the one who was the man pleaser, in reality, it was their doctrine of circumcision and law keeping that was more man pleasing. Paul tells us this in Galatians chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. Paul says, Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised, simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So it was the Judaizers who were really the people pleasers, not Paul. And again, we see in another letter that Paul wrote to Titus. In Titus 1, 10 through 11, Paul says, For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. See, it was the Judaizers, not Paul, who sought to gain the affections of men by the doctrines that they taught. Paul, on the other hand, he suffered much for the gospel that he preached. Paul reminds us of this in 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 11, verses 23 to 28. Listen to the things that Paul went through. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonment, be in times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false, false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. So again, Paul endured much. And if it was Paul who was seeking to be the people pleaser, well, let's be frank. If Paul was the people pleaser, he was terrible at pleasing people based on all the things that he dealt with. But as I mentioned, that's not the case at all. Paul knew and understood that if he, were, if he was to be a servant of God, he could not simultaneously or equally please people, and be a true servant of God. Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. See, a faithful preacher of the word can't seek to please men and God equally. Whether it's in favor or not, a preacher must remember they, like Paul, are a servant, a slave of God, and thus are to be obedient to their call. Now, Paul continues on in verses 11 through 12 to give us the thesis for his defense of the ministry itself. We see right off the gate that he repeats in, this, in these two verses what he stated earlier in verse chapter 1, in verse 1. Where if you recall, Paul said he was an apostle not sent from men nor through the agency of men, but through Jesus Christ and God. 
And we see here in verses 11 through 12, Paul tells us, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul is telling us that his ministry was of divine origin. See, it is likely that the Judaizers were claiming that Paul was taught by the apostles, like them. And thus he was deviating from what he was taught, unlike them. Their tactic was to paint Paul as teaching something that was contrary to the apostles' teaching. And this becomes clearer when we see how throughout the rest of the chapter, Paul makes a point to state not how, how wait, to state how he did not immediately talk with the apostles or go to Jerusalem. Paul wanted to emphasize the fact of how he was called so as to defend his ministry from the false claims of the Judaizers. Again, in trying to discredit Paul, the Judaizers sought to level the authoritative playing field. If they could say that Paul was taught by the apostles, as they claim to also be taught by the apostles, then they can throw the accusation of Paul teaching something contrary to the apostles. Also, in attempting to make this claim, this would also throw Paul's claim to be an apostle into question. Was he really an apostle or just a minister taught by the apostles? Just keep in mind, all apostles are ministers, but not all ministers are apostles. If Paul was truly an apostle, then these Judaizers were completely out of line in everything that they were saying in regards to Paul. However, if Paul was merely a misguided minister who misunderstood what the apostles taught him, or maybe wasn't even taught by the apostles, but some bad teacher, well, it was the duty of the Judaizers to set him in the Galatian church straight. So we can start to see why Paul is making some of the emphasis that he is making in this section. John Calvin tells us this. What then? Shall the authority of the word be diminished? Because one who has been instructed by the instrumentality of men shall afterwards become a teacher? We must take into account all along the weapons with which the false apostles attacked him, alleging that his gospel was defective and spurious, that he had obtained it from an inferior and incompetent teacher, and that his imperfect education led him to make unguarded statements. They boasted, on the other hand, that they had been instructed by the highest apostles, with whose views they were most intimately acquainted. It was therefore necessary that Paul should state his doctrine in opposition to the whole world and should rest it on this ground, that he had acquired it not in the school of any man, but by revelation from God. In no other way could he have set aside the reproaches of the false apostles. Continuing on, we see in verses 13 through 14, Paul highlighting his life prior to his conversion. We see, Paul tells us this, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. In defending his call to apostleship, he reminds the Galatians of who he was prior to his conversion. Now we can see who he was, we can see an account of that in the book of Acts. If we look at Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, we see Luke telling us this, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. And then we see Paul give us some, um, some more account in regard to his life prior to his conversion as he was speaking with Agrippa in Acts chapter 29, verses 9 through 11. Paul tells Agrippa this, 
So then, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them, often in all the synagogue, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously engaged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. So, Paul was not a friend of Christianity prior to his conversion, prior to his salvation. On top of that, not only was Paul a persecutor of the church, Paul was a Pharisee. And he reminds us of this in another epistle that he wrote to the Philippian church. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, Paul says, Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. So, we can see from these passages of Scripture that Paul was not a person who was seeking out the truth of this supposed Messiah. He was grooming himself to be a great Jewish defender and not the great Christian defender God called him to be. All of this is important to recount because if Paul had not truly been changed by Christ on that road to Damascus, this doctrine in particular that the Judaizers were propagating that taught the upholding of the Jewish ceremonial law would have been something that Paul, if he were willing to accept the claims of Jesus being the Messiah, would have most likely gravitated towards because it advocated the keeping of the law, something that he was zealous to do in his former life as a Pharisee and a persecutor of the church. After Paul recounts his life prior to his conversion, then he reminds them of his conversion, of that miraculous conversion on the road to Damascus. Verses 15 through 16 of Galatians, chapter 1, he says, But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Verse 17, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. So right off the, right off the gate in verse 15, when Paul says, when God who had set me apart even from my mother's womb, Paul borrows from the language of the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, when Jeremiah, in his commentary said, or in verse 1, or chapter 1, says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Paul was a Calvinist. Paul understood that God had appointed him to this ministry before the foundation of the world. And Paul says as such, in chapter, in verse 15, it set me apart even from my mother's womb. Paul continues in defending his ministry to point out in verse 16 how Jesus calls him on the road to Damascus, how he did not seek after the apostles to be taught by them. He says, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. But before we dive into that, I, I want for us to recount and remember this miraculous conversion of Paul. So let us go back to the book of Acts and look at chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, 
hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate or drank. So, we see here, in this passage, this miraculous calling of Paul. How he was on the way to persecute the Christians, and God, on the way to Damascus, called him into the ministry. Now, I think this is particularly important for us to remember because in particular, this office of apostle is a unique office. It's an office in which God directly calls those to that office itself. We see prior to Jesus' crucifixion, while he dwelt on the earth, Jesus called the original 12 apostles, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the other James, that is Simon, and of course the betrayer Judas Iscariot. And we see post-crucifixion and ascension, Jesus calling Paul as he was headed to Damascus to persecute the Christians. That is why in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8, Paul refers to himself as an apostle untimely born. So, like the other apostles, Paul's call came directly from Jesus Christ himself. Again, Paul reminds us in the beginning of Galatians that he was an apostle not sent from man nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ himself. And we can see in the book of Acts this being the case. Paul again recounts his conversion and this call to the ministry as he stands before Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verses 12 through 18. Paul tells Agrippa this, while so engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it hard for you to kick against the goats? And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So again, we see in this passage, this calling to this apostleship directly by Jesus Christ himself, not from man, but by God himself. Verse 16, again, I mentioned that he says that he did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Now, this term flesh and blood is an idiom for man. Basically, what he means is that he did not immediately consult with man. Now, at first glance, this seems to contradict the narrative we get when we continue to read Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 10. So let's read that, 10 through 19. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named, named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight. And he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. So we see here in this passage it says that after all of this took place, for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. But then Paul says in Galatians 1.16 that he did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. So was Paul lying here when he said he did not consult with men? The reason I bring this up is because it's passages like this that people who deny the faith, skeptics, atheists, non-Christians, will use to try and make it seem as though the Bible's contradicting them itself. And the reality of the fact is, that's not the case at all. Paul was not lying when he said he did not immediately consult with men, because what he meant was not what so many people might assume. If we remember, the general, the general argument that Paul has been making up to this point is that his doctrine is not one that was influenced by any man, but was revealed to him by Jesus. So when he says he did not consult with men, he means that he was not taught by the apostles. Or in other words, Paul is saying that after his conversion and call, he did not seek anyone to be instructed by. So continuing on, we see Paul says in verse 17, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Now, more than likely, when Paul mentions he went away to Arabia, he is referring to the Nepotian kingdom, which is a Romanized Arabian region which stretched east of Damascus down to the Sinai Peninsula. And if you look on a map, or I guess an ancient map, during the time of Paul, you will see how relatively close that region in Arabia is to Damascus where Paul was converted. So continuing on, in verses 18 through 21, we see Paul continue to make this defense of his divine ministry. He says, Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to be acquainted with Cephas. Now Cephas is the Aramaic name for Paul, for Peter, excuse me. So he is recounting when after three years he went up to see Peter. And stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So, John Calvin has this to say in regards to this passage. Thus, he did not at the outset receive the calling of men. But lest it should be supposed that he had separate interests from theirs and was desirous to avoid their society, he tells us that he went up for the express purpose to see Peter. Although he had not waited for their sanction before undertaking the office, yet it was not against their will, but with their full consent and approbation that he held the rank of an apostle. He is desirous to show that at no period was he at variance with the apostles and that even now he is in full harmony with all their views. By mentioning the short time that he remained there, he shows that he had come not with a view to learn, but solely for mutual intercourse. So basically, in this account here that Paul is, that Paul is giving, he is mentioning the time that he spent. So even though Paul is spending time demonstrating that he was not instructed by the apostles, he does not want to now have the Galatians think that his teachings are running counter to what the apostles teach. So he recounts this point here where he visits Peter after three years of being in the ministry to show that though the apostles did not teach him, he was still in sync with them. He wasn't running counter to what the apostles were doing. So continuing, verse 21, he says, then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Now, the regions of Syria and Cilicia is more than likely referring to the cities of Tarsus, which is in Cilicia, and Antioch, which is in Syria. We see from the book of Acts that these were places that Paul visited. In Acts 9, verses 29 through 30, when it became apparent that Paul's life was in danger, the disciples in Jerusalem sent him away to Tarsus in Cilicia. While there, in Acts chapter 11, verses 22 through 26, 
we see Barnabas going to Tarsus to bring Paul over to Antioch in Syria to teach the growing number of Christians. So, Paul is clearly marking all of this out to point to the fact that his message, though in agreement with the other apostles, was not dictated to him by the other apostles. He was and is preaching the truth as it was revealed to him by God. The commentators of the Geneva, Geneva Bible tells us this. Because it might be objected that indeed he was called of Christ in the way, but afterwards words was instructed of the apostles and others whose names the false apostles abused to destroy his apostleship as though he delivered another gospel than the true apostles did and as though he were not of their number which are to be credited without exception therefore Paul answered that he began straightway after his calling to preach the gospel at Damascus and in Arabia and was not from that time in Jerusalem but only 15 days where he saw only Peter and James and afterwards he began to teach in Syria and Cilicia with the consent and approbation of the churches of the Jews which knew him only by name so far off was it that he was there instructed of men. So, continuing on, verses 22 to 24, we read, Paul telling us this, I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing. He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. Paul was no small persecutor. His renown for going to churches to persecute them was clearly known by all the Christians. We see, for example, we just read in verse 13 how he said, For you have heard of my former manner of life. You've heard of who I was prior to my conversion. It was no secret who Paul was prior to that fateful journey on the road to Damascus, where Christ calls him. We even see how Ananias, in Acts chapter 9, after his conversion, was initially hesitant to go to Paul and he told God, wait a minute, I've heard of this guy Saul, and I've heard of what he did to the Christians, how he persecuted them. So Paul's reputation was clearly known itself. So in light of the massive transformation that happened on the road to Damascus, we should not be surprised at the early trepidation by the saints regarding Paul. I mean, is this really for real? I mean, or is he going undercover as a Christian to find out more about us in order to destroy us? I mean, can we really be sure that this transformation is genuine? I mean, this was the same guy who was part of the crew that killed our brother Stephen. How, how can we trust them? And going back to Acts chapter 9, we see that the Christians in Damascus were baffled at what they were seeing, him preaching Christ crucified. And the Christians in Jerusalem were even fearful of him, thinking that this conversion was not real. However, once the reality that God did indeed transform Paul, these Christians glorified God. The Christians realized that the only way someone, something this earth-shattering could have happened was if God did it. Given how zealous Paul was for his Jewish faith, only the power of God could have stopped him dead in his trap and caused him to preach this gospel message. So the realization that God took their biggest threat and turned him into one of the most cherished apostles caused these Christians, as Paul recounts here, to glorify God. Only the power of God could have taken Paul, a Christian-hating persecutor, into the person writing this letter to the Galatians. Only the power of God could have taken Paul, a person who was seeking to kill the faith, into a person who was willing to die for the faith. This should be a reminder for us that the power of God is stronger than the will of man. No heart is so hard that God can't soften it. No sinner is so stained that Christ's blood can't cleanse it. No human plan is so cemented that God can't thwart it. God called 
Paul to be an apostle. Now, Paul had other plans initially. Had it been solely left up to him, Paul would have been satisfied with being a great world-renowned Pharisee. However, on that fateful day, as he was headed to Damascus to persecute some more Christians, Jesus literally blindsided him and turned him into one of the more adored apostles. And as an apostle of God, his teachings carried authority that the Judaizers did not have. Though they may have claimed that they were teaching the true apostolic doctrine, nothing could be further from the truth. But even if we granted to them that they were merely teaching what the apostles taught them, Paul's credentials comes from something or someone higher than even the apostles. The Judaizers claimed to be taught by the apostles. Fine, Paul was taught by Jesus himself. They claimed to have been sent by the apostles. Paul was sent by Jesus himself. They claimed that they were walking in step with the apostles. Paul was walking in step with Christ. Paul, in appealing to an authority higher than the apostles, had the ultimate checkmate. Now, make no mistake about it, their doctrine was not apostolic. It was heretical. But before, before Paul starts to dissect their bad arguments in the next few chapters, he first had to remind them and the Galatians that his calling to the ministry was not of men, but of God. Let's now go to the Lord in prayer.